Hello, and welcome to the Supporting Vulnerable and At-Risk Youth Transitioning Out of Foster Care Program Performance Measure Training Session. My name is Erin Rose Healy, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Caitlin Hutchinson. We are Training and Technical Assistance Specialists providing contractor support to the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. On the screen right now is a short glossary of acronyms that you might see peppered throughout the presentation. We just wanted to stop to take a moment to acknowledge these common acronyms to make sure that we're all on the same page. Our objectives for the session today are to start with a review of the solicitation to understand the goals and objectives because it's from that solicitation that the performance measures were derived. We'll then take some time to go through and highlight some of the key performance measures from your assigned question set. We'll end our session today with providing some additional performance reporting resources, as well as our contact information. Thanks, Erin. As Erin stated, my name is Kate, and I work alongside Erin providing training and technical assistance support for OJJDP. We'll be starting by reviewing the program background. Some of you may know that OJJDP's guiding philosophy is to enhance the welfare of America's youth and broaden their opportunities for a better future. To bring these goals to fruition, OJJDP is leading efforts to transform the juvenile justice system into one that will treat children as children, serve children at home with their families, in their communities, and open up opportunities for system-involved youth. OJJDP encourages all proposed applications that work with youth to highlight how the proposed program aligns with these priorities. Here we see the program background. As you can see from that second bullet point, we're going to explore the solicitation. And we see here that the solicitation recognizes the need to offer high quality services and treatment to help put youth who are transitioning from foster care on a track for success. Now let's examine the program goals. We can see that the first goal is to build replicable treatment models for residential-based innovative care or services for youth. The second goal is to provide crisis stabilization services, including safe, stable, permanent housing. And the third goal is to support educational services, provide access to mental health care, and develop additional life skills. Now, when it comes to performance reporting, we all play a part. As the OJJDP grantee, you're responsible for creating a performance management plan, reporting on performance measure data, and monitoring federal funds and award timelines. Your OJJDP grant manager is responsible for reviewing performance reports, aligning your performance measures to award goals, and improving budget changes. The performance management team is responsible for creating the performance measures, providing training, technical assistance, or help desk assistance, and performing data analysis or data validation. The theme here is that we're all in this together to make your program successful. While we're reviewing your program measures, you'll see the following three phrases throughout the document. First, you may see a phrase that says OJJDP overall measures. What this means is that this is a measure that many grantees are asked to report. These questions are intentionally broad. You'll also see a phrase multi-program measures. This means we have grantees with similar programs report on three different types of populations, 
including shared targeted populations, similar service delivery models, and shared outcomes. And the third phrase you'll see something called program specific measures. Those are with grantees with similar solicitations that report on data aligned to a specific population funded activity or desired result. We will be referring to these categories throughout this presentation. Thanks, Kate. Now that we've had a moment to look back at the solicitation as well as those goals and objectives, now we can go directly into the performance measures themselves. So, where do you find your performance measures? They are here in what we call the definition and questions document. This is the list or place where anyone on your team can find all of your assigned performance measures outside of the JustGrant system. One thing we do want to note about this document is that you should interpret each of the questions that you will see in column three as something that happened during the activity period, usually meaning the last six months, unless the question otherwise indicates. You'll notice on the definition and questions document, there are multiple sections. As Kate just mentioned, each of the sections are going to have different types of measures. So let's start with the first section on the document that relates to individuals served. And as Kate mentioned, these are OJGDP overall measures, meaning that they are very broad, providing you and all other grantees with multiple options around how to report your data. We also wanna highlight the individuals served because this is a key performance measure. The individuals served are those that receive services from your program during the activity period, and that's going to mean the last six months. And the total of all of the questions in number one are going to be that key performance measure that you're going to use as a, what we call a validation or a checkpoint against other performance measures further down into the document. Remember to report numbers only for a grant funded population. You will notice within question one, as mentioned, there's quite a variety of options in terms of age ranges to report, as well as new and carried over. We'd like to show you on this slide a bit more about what these phrases mean. Carried over, that's kind of a way to say returning clients. Those who have been part of the OJJDP funded program for maybe the last couple of reporting periods. Someone is new, meaning that they are entering your program, basically receiving services for the first time with grant funds. A person may be in that carried over number for multiple reporting periods, but they're only new in one reporting period. The full list of questions in number one provides you with a variety of age ranges. Again, you're going to report data here that are relevant to the age ranges and the populations that you serve. If your organization, for example, is serving youth who are ages 11 to 17 and their parents and guardians, you will focus on those specific questions. You may enter zero for the populations that your program is not serving. Once you've finished entering data, 
for question one, as mentioned, please go through and total up the entire number for that question. This will be used as what we call a validation or a checkpoint against other performance measures. When I say add up everything in question one, that is meaning all individuals served in 1A through 1J. Now we're going to take a look at the service delivery section. You'll note that this section makes up questions 2 through 11 and includes OJJDP overall measures, multi-program measures, and program-specific measures. Since most of the questions are OJJDP overall measures, we'll be reviewing a few program-specific service delivery measures to go over with you shortly. One thing you'll notice is that the OJJDP overall measure asking about service delivery will be asking you about your evidence-based practice or evidence-based program. Look to your definitions and questions document in column two for an explanation of the difference between the two, as well as a list of databases to check, such as crimesolutions.gov or the OJJDP model programs database you should find your answers within those websites. Now let's examine a program-specific measure in question 10. This question asks about eligible individuals served by emergency shelter care. So for this question, we'd like to draw your attention to the bottom of the slide. Think about how your program defines emergency shelter care. Examples can include emergency respite care to prevent caregiver burnout or a last resort, last resort hoteling with a caseworker while more permanent housing is secured. You'll want to think about the agreements you have in place with community partners. Perhaps your organization partners with your local community-based behavioral health provider to provide emergency respite care during times of crisis. Or perhaps you partner with a local treatment foster care or therapeutic foster care provider that can offer short-term respite care until the crisis has been resolved and the youth can re-enter their foster home placement. Or in worst case scenarios, did the client have to stay in a hotel with a caseworker or guardian because no foster care homes were available during a time of crisis? Again, the key here is to think about how your specific program defines emergency shelter care while more permanent housing is secured for the youth. Now let's look at question 11. This question asks about eligible individuals served by a crisis stabilization program. Again, we'd like to draw your attention to the note at the bottom that this definition does not include inpatient residential care. So if your organization would like more information to determine whether your program is considered a crisis program, please reach out to your program manager. So remember, in some regions, mobile crisis teams can be called to the foster home to help de-escalate a crisis situation. And some counties also have crisis stabilization centers, which are free to the public. These centers typically have multidisciplinary teams on staff and are open 24-7. Now we're going to move forward to the training and technical assistance section. Now, before we start to examine these measures, we'd like to remind you that, yes, these questions make up 12 through, through 14, but also questions 17 and 18. These are OJJDP overall measures, which means, again, that these are very broad questions. Let's take a look at training and technical assistance performance measures, the questions and what they mean. So again, this is an OJJDP overall category, meaning very broad questions. When you're reporting on these measures, 
Um, remember that you're going to want to report training events used using award funds. And technical assistance is a pretty broad term. When you report in just grants, you will be reporting numbers, but you'll also be reporting the population or types of technical assistance in text. So for questions 12 through 14 regarding training and technical assistance, you're going to want to think about events such as foster parent orientation, crisis prevention intervention training, or perhaps collaborative problem solving training. Think back, did your local community health council ask you to provide a training on crisis prevention? Or were you asked by your local school district to provide trainings on collaborative problem solving? Remember that the training requests counted are during the activity period. And again, that means during the last six months. Here we'll also look at question 16, which is a multi-program measure. This is asking for the number of memorandums of agreements or understandings, otherwise known as MOA or MOU, implemented. So think back, during the last activity period, did you implement any new MOAs or MOUs? This could be perhaps your community-based mental health provider, a Boys and Girls Club, Teen Center, or a therapeutic after-school camp. If you did implement any new MOAs or MOUs during the activity period, please enter the number. Looking at question 17 and training and technical assistance, this question is asking about training participants who reported using training knowledge or skills within three months. So let's think. If your organization has not facilitated a training during the reported period, reporting period, your answer, of course, would be zero or an A. Remember that this question is asking about the skills used, not taught. The training needs to be put into action. So, for example, let's say you held a training on crisis prevention and intervention. You conduct a follow-up survey two months later asking the participants if they have actively used any skills they learned during that training. You can take that data and enter it into the question set. And question 18 asks about organizations using a new evidence-based or promising service, policy, or practice recommended by a technical assistance provider. When reviewing this question, remember that a promising practice is an evidence rating on a model programs guide that indicates a program that has some evidence that it achieves its intended outcome. More extensive research is recommended. And you can read more about promising practices or promising services at the Model Programs Guide Review Process and Evidence Ratings. You'll look for promising programs that are represented throughout the website with a promising icon that looks like a yellow check mark. Thanks, Kate. Now, take a moment to look at the collaboration section. Question 15 relates to the number of individuals served by a multidisciplinary team. Please remember this is a team of individuals, not organizations, that have a different background and for example, these could include uh, peer support workers, these could include forensic nurses, CASA workers, but they have all different sorts of backgrounds that are coming together to support a specific client. Let's go back now into the prevention and intervention section. 
again, these are those overall measures where you're going to have to really put some more definition around what prevention or intervention may look like for your specific program. What we want to call out in this section is the questions around detention and the questions around prevention. Please remember that prevention services are used to prevent individuals from entering the juvenile justice system. So please make sure that is part of the goals of your program if you're going to report that specific measure. We also do want to point out the questions around um, eligibility for detention. While there is a general definition of detention on your definition and questions document, we also do urge you to make sure that the individuals that you're including in your data collection fit within any local policies or different ways that jurisdictions will look at detention. There will be a little bit of difference from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and that's okay, as long as you make sure that you are tracking those individuals the same way from reporting period to reporting period to ensure consistency and reliability in the data that you report. The next section is the victimization section. This again is an overall measure, and there's a few things that we want to talk about with this one. While victimization is a topic that all OJJDP grantees are going to be asked about because this is an overall measure, we do want to make sure that this data is collected in a trauma-informed way, meaning that you may need to look with your team at the different ways in which you find out about victimization data, specifically from younger children that you may be working with. Consider all options, and please remember you do not need to ask an individual about victimization every six months. This should be data that you can find from individuals as they choose to report it, or from parents, caregivers. There can be a variety of sources that your team can collaborate on to collect this data. Thanks, Erin. Let's move forward and look at the Productive Lives section. You'll notice that those are questions 26 through 30 and include OJJDP overall measures, multi-program measures, and program-specific measures. In this section, we'll examine two program-specific measures. First program specific measure is asking about the eligible individuals who completed college access programs. Now, note that this question may not apply to you if you specifically serve youth under the age of 10 or under uh, high school age. If that is the case, you'll want to enter a zero into these sections. However, if you do serve high school age or college age youth, Make sure you read through and identify programs such as an SAT prep course, entrance essay tutoring, or a scholarship application guidance with a guidance counselor or mentor as a college access programs. And in question 29, we'll ask again about eligible individuals who completed college success programs. Now, these success programs can include programs such as career coaching, financial aid counseling, or tutoring. Moving forward to protective factors, you'll notice that questions 31 through 37 make up protective factors. You'll notice also that these are OJJDP overall measures and program specific measures. When looking at protective factors, we suggest that you pick a protective factor or factors that are relevant to your organization's mission. 
you're going to want to think about weaving that factor or factors into your organization's program planning process. Some additional tips for protective factors. So OJJDP recommends that your organization choose at least one protective factor to report on. You'll want to collect the data regarding the protective factors in a way that is most convenient to your organization. So that could be a survey, case notes, an Excel sheet, whatever it is, you'll, you're going to want to make that data collection work for you and your organization. Let's examine a program-specific measure, question 32. This question is asking about the percentage of eligible individuals with positive parent or caregiver relationships. So you'll notice that the term caregiver can include foster parents, biological parents, or biological relatives. You can consider collecting this data from case notes and conversations with the client. So if you're able to document case notes or a survey asking about the client's positive caregiver relationship, you'll be able to track this protective factor throughout the life of the award. Finally, we have the program outcome section, which is question 38, and you'll notice it's program specific question. This question is asking about the eligible individuals released into safe, stable housing. You'll notice that your document gives you definitions on what is actually considered safe and stable housing. So this could include living with a legal guardian or an adoptive family or extended family. For some individuals, this includes transitioning to a group home, independent living, or a supported housing situation. Thanks, Kate. All right, now let's move from your performance measure question set into what we call the progress narrative report. This is the one in Just Grants you may have noticed was labeled P and Q. This is a separate question set. There are 20 questions involved. All of them are OJJDP overall measures. You will notice, of course, that these questions are the same from reporting period to reporting period. And uh, this is the only question set really in Just Grants where you're going to have an opportunity to have that kind of open narrative response and be able to contribute a decent amount of qualitative data. Please do keep an eye on those secondary protective factor effects as they relate to the protective factors that Kate just spoke about. We'll get into that in the next few slides. When you're answering the narrative questions, we'd like you to focus on a few things. First, remember that a performance report is going to change over time as your award progresses. So you really want to think about summarizing the work that was done in the last six months as well as where you hope to go in the, last, in the next six months. You can really only report what you know at the time that the report is generated. Another thing to focus on is to make sure that each of these narrative questions can really stand on their own. If you have multiple objectives that your program is working on, please make sure, for example, that if you stay in progress, you tell your grant manager a little bit about what does in progress mean to you at that time. Another example is additional documentation that may be uploaded with your progress report. We would also encourage you to say a little bit more than see attached. Which attachment do you mean? Why is it important? Look at each of those narratives and make sure that they can tell a story on their own.
Another thing that you're going to want to do with the progress narrative report is use those questions to highlight anything from your performance measures that you may feel needed some additional explanation. For example, maybe you were working on a new screening tool or a new intake process, and when it's complete, you may want to use one of those narrative questions to really talk about how that is affecting work with your families. This is also the place where you're going to make notes around any grant award modifications or different activities that you are planning for the future. One of the last questions in the progress report relates to protective factors, secondary effects. So <clears throat> what you want to do first is start with your protective factors. The first question will ask if you report protective factors. You will answer yes. For the next set of questions, you want to look at those and see, first of all, if you saw any potential secondary effects during the reporting period. What do we mean by secondary effect? Well, as Kate noted, in the protective factors, you're going to choose one or more that really align to your program goals. So if one of the protective factors that you're targeting is a better parent-caregiver relationship, but in the process of targeting that protective factor with services, you notice that maybe there is an increase in positive leisure activities or there is a betterment of a few of the kids that you're working with, engagement with school. That is an example of a protective factor that increased, but it wasn't necessarily something that you targeted with service. So that's where you're going to report here in this question. You'll have a chance to choose from all available protective factors. Remember, this is an OJJDP overall question. Some of the secondary effects that you may see in this list may not feel relevant to your program, and that's okay. Again, these are all possible options. So choose the one that you see, choose the one that you feel best aligns with the positive increase of protective factors that you're seeing. Thank you for taking the time to go over your performance measures with us today. We'd like to end our session talking about a few performance measure reporting resources and ways that you can get in contact with us. Thank you, Erin. Throughout the next slides, we'll offer some resources and how to direct your questions about performance reporting. So for performance measure resources, you can always contact me or the help desk for questions with semi-annual or annual report submission in the PMT. You can also call us for a one-on-one -on -one, uh, WebEx or video support session for your team or organization. And we have some general reporting tips and terms and multiple trainings available on the OJJDP website. This slide shows a printed resource that you may want to bookmark in your browser. This contains many of the phrases that we discussed today, including activity period, carried over, individual served. This should come in handy during the reporting process. Here's the contact information for the PMT Help Desk. The PMT Help Desk is available to help you with any questions that you may have about responding to the progress reported questions or performance measures. The PMT Help Desk returns emails and phone calls within 24 hours, so please don't hesitate to leave a voicemail or email, even after business hours. If you have questions about the Just Grants system, for example, accessing the system or error messages, please call the number you see on your screen or email. 
If you experience any issues with Just Grants, we strongly encourage you to reach out to Just Grants for support. Since there are two help desks, it can get a little confusing. So again, for the OJJDP PMT help desk, you can call us for assigned performance measures, where to report, and if you have a fiscal year 2019 or prior award, you can call us for PMT system accounts or unlock reports. And for the Just Grant Service Desk, again, you'll want to call them for entity management, changing roles and permissions, locating performance reports, or error messages. That concludes our training for today. We'd like to thank you so much for your time, and we encourage you to stay connected with OJJDP. Thank you. <laughs>